Hey there, I am Barb Higgins, and this is A Thousand Tiny Steps. In this podcast, I share my stories of love, loss, triumph, and tragedy as I continue to retrace my steps onto what led to the death of my daughter, Molly. By doing so, I hope to not only help myself, but to bring purpose and possibility to those who listen. If you are ready to laugh, cry, shake your head in disbelief, then tie, buckle, face up, or slip on your shoes, and join me as we begin our thousand tiny steps. Hey everybody, Barb Higgins here, welcoming you to episode 151 and episode four of season nine of a thousand tiny steps. That's a lot of numbers. What's been interesting about this most recent podcast journey of mine, the whole planning ahead and having like a series and a theme, and then using the 12 steps of AA, how much unresolved crap comes up. And I think, I think this is true for everyone. I think sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking we're all just supposed to wake up and be happy. And I always tell my athletes, all winning all your races does is make you complacent and fool yourself. I win all the time. I can just win. We learn the most when we suffer and struggle, lose a race, so to speak. So isn't that a huge dichotomy then, a big conflict of thought that what we think is that we should be happy and what we look at when we look at other people is how perfectly happy they all seem. But what helps us grow and where we learn is in our conflicts and our difficulties. So step one, admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives become unmanageable. So again, I'm reading the steps as authentically as they are written for AA, but I've been looking at so many other things in my life, which all could potentially be ramifications from my issues with alcohol years ago, or the reasons I fall to substances in the first place. So I've looked at a lot of things. I've done the breath work on it, the slowing down, the meditative process, really thinking about the fact that, like I just said, sometimes you have to lose to win. Sometimes the victory is in the struggle, not in the podium spot. That work has been going pretty well. And then step two, the work on that was more the freeing of the heart, the mind, and the body. And that is work that I do all the time. Just before I lost my job in the school district, I did a sabbatical on health. And it was for elementary school students. And I created a whole curriculum. It was really fun and, and wonderful. And what I would teach these students, now keep in mind, it's public school, so I can't teach religion. But I would teach that there were three ways to be healthy. Healthy in your thoughts, healthy in your feelings, and healthy in your body. And so I found children's literature and cooperative games and ways that we can, could develop those things. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So this comes back again and again in all of the breath work in each of the steps, because so much of self-forgiveness and which come, will come up later and all the things that happen as you go through the steps really require, require you to know and believe that some greater force loves you. And step three, the breath work was that radical acceptance that maybe I am loved and lovable simply because I'm here, radically accepting somebody's feelings for you. I have no trouble radically accepting people's negative feelings for me. <laughs> I think sometimes I create them in my head. So step two, I've always believed in God and I've always been able to reach out to God in my struggles. I don't know that I always listen or am aware that he's actually giving me what I need until I do some crazy thing like this and I start to step back and look at my life. All right, step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. He, him, her, they, them, it, the universe, whatever, whatever God is for you. I've, I've had a struggle with this just because I don't really know what that means. Does it mean I stop doing what I'm doing and do things differently? I'm making a decision to turn it over. So I always have to be able to picture it in my head. What am I turning over? So when I've thought about these things over the past week, what comes to mind is my need for control. And I think that's my biggest one. And I think I talked about that a lot in last week's episode that I cling and cling and hold on and do it my way, do it my way, do it my way. I have a hard time accepting a grateful state. It's not that I'm not grateful, but I get irritated with the whole living gratitude thing. And I, and I think it's because I see so much of my life and so much of my struggles involve definitely decisions I made, but people believing things about me that aren't true. And that nothing, nothing irks me more than being disliked for something I didn't do. I had a really traumatic childhood memory that came up when I, just now when I was actually saying this sentence. I got home from gymnastics camp. I'd been gone all summer. And this was in the 1970s. There are no cell phones, no internet, no Wi-Fi, no way to gossip about somebody except behind their back in person with somebody else, right? 
So I get home, I've been gone for eight weeks and I walk around the corner to see my friend Jill and she's on the phone and she goes, ah, she just walked right in. Well, look who's here. And she puts the phone down and screams at me, screams at me for saying all this stuff about her and all this. I stood there dumbfounded. I didn't even know what, what to think. I'm like, I've been away all summer. I just came back today. Like, and she just, you're lying. And it was, and rather than stand up for myself, and I look, I look back on this now and so many flashbacks of other, it's like my life flashing before my eyes come to mind for me. But I went home and I cried and cried and I sobbed. And all I could think about was how to win her back, how to make her like me again. You know, and there was maybe two weeks until school started. It was middle school. It was eighth grade math. And for a short period of time, we were in the same math class, Mrs. Barvenick. And so I'm sitting in the last row, last seat, last row, whatever. And she's placed sort of near me, kitty quarter in front of me. And she's all nice to me, like everything's fine. And I just am so relieved that, every, that everything is fine, that I just fall into it. I just, I just forget that she ever said that I said ter- terrible things about her. A long time later, I asked her about this. And she sort of pawned off that she didn't remember. And I said, well, I remember because it broke my heart. You, you hated me for something I didn't even know what you were talking about. And it stayed with me and it stayed with me for a long, long time. And I've seen the pattern repeat itself again and again, this strong desire to be loved and liked. There's a reason I told this story. Making a decision to turn the will of my will over to God as I see him. Well, I'm working on that. I, you know, does that mean I go to church every Sunday? Does it mean, you know, I think in part, it means that I utilize what I know of God in the universe in a way that's helpful to me. In this search, certain things have come up on Facebook and on my newsfeed and, you know, different things. And it's like, huh, look at that. Or I run into somebody. Why did I run into that person? So step four (laughs) will be no easier for me than step three. The first two weren't bad. Step four is called a good lamp. That's the name of the chapter in this book. Made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Step four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Now, it's no coincidence that step one, the acknowledgement. Step two is the relinquishing. Step three is the deciding. All that a power greater than ourselves not only can restore us to sanity, but loves us. And that it's our job to give over to it. In the process of giving over to it, you're acknowledging that you are lovable and loved by something so amazingly huge, you can't see it. Maybe the power of the universe, maybe the good Lord Almighty up above, you know, however you, however you channel your higher power. Of course, those would precede step four, which again reads, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. This just brings to mind my why I hate myself list. And I have a long list. And I think some of this work has brought it up a little bit for me. (laughs) I hate myself. I hate myself. Oh my God, I hate myself. And it's hard. It's hard on me because I have no trouble making a list of everything I suck at or why I suck. But that isn't what this means. A searching and fearless moral inventory doesn't mean a list of all your flaws. That's what you think it means. And a lot of people raised with conflict over good and bad, you know, like I'm being molested by the guy that yells at me for pulling my pants down to pee outside. That makes no sense, right? That's part of my moral inventory. Not that that I caused this, I did this sinful thing, but that my misunderstanding around reality based on experiences like this contribute to the decisions I make. And that's the moral inventory what you've gone through, how you see things, not only looking at what you've done, but how and why those things came to be and what's been done to you. All of that plays into the moral inventory. Now, keep in mind too, this book, Breathing Underwater, is looking at the 12 steps from a spiritual reality, a spiritual mindset. And the first thing it goes into is how hard this is for people to to analyze themselves in a moral way, a moral inventory. We think of morality as black and white. So it says analysis is paralysis. And this is what happens to a lot of people in the beginning of step two. I mean, in the beginning of step four is they just get, nope, nope, can't do it. No, thank you. They get sort of paralyzed in it. And that's me. That's me right now in the beginning of this. That's me in reading this book and in this chapter and preparing for this episode. So I'll read to you some notes I took, and then I'm going to read some from the book as well. We can talk about where I'm at with my moral inventory. While the truth will, in fact, set you free, it will first make you miserable. (laughs) Yes, yes. Here's a good example. It's a Molly example. When I, when I finally accepted the truth that Molly was dead, that she was never going to wake up, I peed my pants, I screamed, I cried, but I had to do all of those things before I could turn around, get a new pair of pants, wipe the snot off my face, 
dry my tears, and focus on all of the tasks at hand, right? The truth, Molly will never wake up, set me free from this gripping, mindless pacing and waiting and hoping and praying, all the while sort of knowing that she wasn't going to wake up, right? So that's sort of the best example I can give of how I feel about that. Medieval spirit writers called this compunction, the necessary sadness and humiliation that comes with seeing our failures and weaknesses. The necessary sadness and humiliation. So that lets me off the hook a little bit in terms of self-flagellation and self-judgment. Doesn't let me off the hook for things I've done that I think are wrong, but it makes me start to see that, that we're not being asked to hate ourselves or to make a list of how we, we suck. What we're doing is we're being asked to take a good, honest, open look at ourselves. Who are we? So for example, I'm controlling. And so why am I controlling? How does my controlling manifest itself in behaviors and conversation? How does it affect people around me? That's the moral inventory, right? What am I doing because of what's happened to me and how is that affecting me and those around me? Yes, it's looking at our flaws and our mistakes and our misgivings and our tragedies and our traumas, but not all of those things were self-directed or conscious or a choice. And so, but they all play a part in how we function as human beings. Without confidence in a greater love, so this is you know your higher power, none of us will have the courage to go inside ourselves, and nor should we. The steps are amazing. They set you up for support before they ask you to do the hard stuff. Go ahead and acknowledge that you're, that you're powerless. Let it go. Begin the process of accepting a higher power. Decide to turn yourself over to the higher power, and then take a look in the mirror, right? So then it gets a little biblical. Life began with a transgression, Adam and Eve and the apple and eating the apple and, you know, oh my God, procreation, the big sin, right? So we're taught in the Christian religion that life began sinfully. <laughs> Great. So one of the things that's supposed to feel awesome is sex and exhibits love and creates life is now like a transgression, right? That's how our whole life is. I'm not a fan of the Adam and Eve story as a morality teacher. Anyway, life began with transgression. The law, or law in general, was given to multiply the opportunities for falling. Okay, why would Jesus want to just make us fail all the time, right? If that's what the law is. So the goal, here it is. So the goal is not to live without sin, because that's impossible. Nobody is perfect. But in the struggle itself, and the encounter and wisdom that come from the struggle, that goes back to losing the race. You run so hard, you think you're doing everything right and you get out kicked at the finish and you run that race over and over again in your head. The law says, oh, I, I need to win this race. You don't. So you failed, right, inside your head. And you analyze and repicture and run again a million times trying to figure out where'd you go wrong. And your next race will be better because of it. So there's luminosity and awareness here. Luminosity and awareness. Luminosity means light. Let's go back to the title of this chapter, The Lamp. And awareness. Take a look around, right? Just take a look. Step out. Step out of yourself. Step back. Take a look. Take a breath and detach. Compassion for the world is built here in step four. We develop compassion for others by taking a fearless and moral inventory of ourselves. The law was given to multiply the opportunities for falling so that grace can be even greater. So God's grace, grace is like radical acceptance, the ultimate forgiveness, love for no other reason than you should be loved. In other words, the goal is actually not the perfect avoidance of all sin, which is not possible anyway, but the struggle itself and the, the encounter and wisdom that come from it. Law and failure create foil, which creates the conflict, which leads to a very different kind of victory than any of us expected. Not perfect moral victory, nor moral superiority, but luminosity, of awareness and compassion for the world, which becomes our real moral victory. So the mistakes we make, the punishments we receive, the growth we receive from said punishments or consequences give us luminosity and light and love and compassion. Go figure. After 30 years in perfect recovery, alcoholics are still imperfect and still alcoholic, and they know it which is what makes the difference. So this is interesting because there are those who criticize the AA and the 12 steps in this program because they say that once you've been sober for a long time, why are you still insulting yourself? Why are you still calling yourself an alcoholic? If you haven't had a drink in 30 years. That's one of the things I loved most about it when I first went to AA in my late 20s. I'd listen to the speakers, these people in their 50s and 60s who seemed so old to me then. 
And they would just talk about, you know, you, you open a meeting with, hi, I'm Barb, I'm an alcoholic. And everyone says, hi, Barb. And they acknowledge I'm a struggling and grateful alcoholic, 30 years sober. They're not belittling themselves or boxing themselves into this title. They're acknowledging that they are what they are. This imperfect piece of themselves is what created light within them to turn around and serve others. So this is alcohol. So this can be anything. This can be any decision you make. It can be how I feel about people. It can be my control. It can be not wanting to forgive people. It can be everything. But we're talking about this moral inventory right now. God has imprisoned all people in their own disobedience so that God can show mercy to all people. It feels like a divine catch-22, sort of a no-win situation. It is more like a lose-win. You're imprisoned in your own disobedience. There's the loss. So that you can receive mercy. There's the win. Or even a win-win because your own disobedience gives you such gifts. It's not a double bind, which I talked about a few episodes back, but a double release. God has trapped us all inside of certain grace and enclosed all things human in a constant need for mercy. The subconscious sort of yearning in all of us, it's what makes people explore. The great explorers that sailed the oceans or climbed the mountains or crossed the deserts, right? This all comes from this internal sort of motivation. This is how I see it, that we want to grow. We want to find things out. We want to find the answers. But why? But why? But why? You watch a toddler in a new toy room, and they, they look at everything. They turn everything over. They pick everything up. It's our natural inclination to want to learn and to grow and to see. So if we are always going to be making mistakes, making poor decisions, so that we receive from those things, learning and grace and love, then we'll keep doing them. So it sounds contradictory, doesn't it? Like, oh, you're just going to keep fucking up your whole life. I don't think that's what it is. But in terms of creating and, and doing a, a fearless and searching moral inventory, it does open your eyes up to the fact that your list of mistakes and transgressions aren't just a list of flaws. It's a, a descriptive story of your life. None of us needs or expects perfect people around us, but we do want people who can be upfront and honest about their mistakes and limitations and hopefully grow from them. So again, that goes back to the alcoholic saying, hi, I'm Barb, I'm an alcoholic, and they've been sober for 30 years, and they're still saying that. They're acknowledging. The thing that got me at this podium speaking tonight was my inability to manage alcohol. And 30 years later, I'm grateful that I'm here. It's that. The readings go into it a bit now to the prodigal son. It's a biblical story. So those of you that aren't Christian, it's basically about a father and two sons. And one son goes off and you know, lives a life of debauchery and spends money and makes all these terrible mistakes and le just leaves. And the other son stays home out of a sense of duty and obligation. And he's good to his father and he does everything he's told. And his father appreciates all of this and is kind and loving to his son. But then the prodigal son, the son that took off comes back and he says, father, I'm so sorry. I realize in all of the things I've done that where my place is here and will you have me back? And the dad throw this, throws this huge party and celebrates the return of the son. And the other son is like, you know, basically, what the hell? I, I never did anything. I stayed here. You never gave me a party. And the father points out that, no, you're right. I didn't give you a party, but you didn't fall off the cliff of knowledge and love into a pit of despair. He did. And he could potentially have never come back, but he came back. He figured it out. And that's huge. This immediately flashes me to when I was teaching at Walker School. I chose a kid named Billy Harbrick to give President Clinton a Walker School track t-shirt. Billy Harbrick was one of those kids that never broke a rule. He was a good kid all the time. And we had some really rough kids in the Walker community. And oftentimes, if they could go a whole week without punching somebody, they'd get an ice cream cone. And Billy was like, what the hell? I never punch anybody. I don't get ice cream cones. It's just like that. It's the difference between equality and equity that sometimes a situation has to be sort of inclusive and in, in, in a bubble and it, and it matches. It's why I picked Billy to give Bill Clinton the t-shirt. There's your lifetime of ice, ice cream cones, my friend. <laughs> you know, it was just one of those things. That's what comes to mind for me. In the process of taking a, a searching moral inventory, I immediately go right back to all of the things that have happened to me. I go right back to my childhood and all of the things I saw and knew of, all the things that happened to me and learned and how I processed them and, and the advice I got when I asked it and what the adults did for me to try to make it better. I just watch it like a movie sometimes. And I realize through no way of excuse making that so many of my thought processes, so many of my mood swings, so much of my unhappiness was really just instilled in me 
before I even grew boobs, <laughs> you know, like a long time ago. And I grew boobs late, <laughs> but it helps me to make sense and sort of process my decision-making, my drug use, my alcoholism, my promiscuity, my inability for a long time to, to be faithful in a relationship. I always had to have an escape hatch, my inability to truly fall in love, my inability to forgive myself primarily, but I have a hard time with forgiveness. I can say it. I mostly have an easy time forgiving somebody if I'm desperate for them to love me. I have a current example right now. I have a former runner who is an adult now with kids and a husband and all this. She was very involved in the school side of my job loss. Her father was a, an administrator, but I spoke of her a couple of episodes back, the notebook episode. And she shuns me. We were able to communicate and talk for a long time. She asked for help on a couple of things, but she sees me and turns her head and walks away. And I, I have no idea why. I think it's connected to another social group I'm involved with and the situation in Bo, but I'm speculating here. She reached out to try to get into my Barb's track camp group. And, you know, I, I can't see any of her social media. So that would, Im that would impair what I could see of her posts on the page. We can't message because she has me blocked. So I declined the invite. I don't know why she wants to be on the Barb's track camp page. It's, it befuddles me. I had to go through a therapy session with Carolina to get the strength up to do this because what I want is for everything to be okay with me and this person. I don't want her to hate me. I don't know why she hates me. I don't know at all what happened, but she does. There it is. So I thought, you know, I need to be true to myself. <laughs> she could have sent an email or a message saying, I'd like to join the group and here's why. That comes up in my fearless moral inventory. Why do I feel that way? Why did I want to just let her into the group to see what she wanted when she could have ulterior motives? Why is my desire for her to not hate me bigger than what she may or may not want to do with Barb's track camp group? It was just interesting. That came up for me. These things. It's funny what comes up. The lasting meaning behind the message of the prodigal son, the son that came back, is that sometimes the people that make the mistakes and learn from them are the ones who are right. That... If you're taking advice on alcohol recovery and you have a 30 year sober alcoholic who lives a life of gratitude and has gone through the 12 steps two or three times, or someone who's never had a problem with alcohol, but does coaching or counseling or whatever, some of the best knowledge you're going to glean is from the drunk that's recovered from the alcoholic that went through all this because they're willing to say, Hey, here's where I fucked up. Here's some of the really bad shit I did when I was drunk. And here's what I learned from it. And here's how I can help you. I can't undo your shit, but I can help you process it. It's such an incredible act of service. Okay, then it says shadow boxing is an ongoing necessity. Shadow boxing is, a, is an ongoing necessity in looking at our moral inventory, shadow boxing. So shadow boxing is when you fight an invisible opponent or you box around something, right? So I always think of Marty, my college roommate. She used to shadow box in front of a mirror for races, making believe that her reflection was the person she wanted to beat in the race. I used to love watching her. She was terrific. Shout out Marty Shea. So the Bible says we are created in the likeness of God. So if you're an atheist or, or don't necessarily believe in God, we're created in the likeness of the universe. So if you take human beings and all of our ridiculousness out of the equation, we could all disappear from planet earth and planet earth would be fine. Yeah. All we do is fuck it up, but everything in nature is created with a purpose. Some things are created to feed something else and their whole purpose is to be food for something else. Some things are created to create oxygen and provide shade. Other things are created to hold dirt in place. Other things are created to find, pollinate flowers. And I mean, everything. And we were created to reproduce our species, to, to keep our species alive on the planet. And there's scientific and biological ways that that happens. However, that doesn't mean that we're created perfect. If the image of God is perfect, which is what we're taught, we're taught that God is almighty and perfect and we can never be close, but we're created in his image. <laughs> to me, that means we have potential. We have the potential to manifest everything that we are taught about God that is beautiful and perfect and wonderful. But here's what God or Jesus has to say about that, according to this book. The likeness of God exists in simple honesty and humility. Simple honesty and humility. The prodigal son, he comes back. I fucked up, dad. I'm sorry. Can I come home? Our soul knows that we grow best in the shadow lands, shadow boxing, the shadow lands. What does this mean? Well, if we think as for perfection as a bright light, 
Look into the sun. The sun is perfect. You can't. It's too bright. It burns your eyes. If we think of evil as pitch black, try to walk around in a pitch black room. You lose all sense of spatial awareness. You fall to the ground. It's impossible. Nothing can exist in our human state in either one of those realities. We exist on a continuum, continuum in between. And the soul knows that the best growth happens in the shadow lands where there is just enough light to show you what you need to see to grow, but not so much light that all you see are the flaws and the mistakes. So I often think of when you're at like a nightclub or a bar or a show or a theater, right? And the lights are dimmed and you, you dance and there's a DJ playing and the lights are dim and everyone's dressed up and the night goes along, right? And then it's time to go home and they turn the lights on and the lights are really bright and you can see that everyone's sweating and the place is a mess and the rug has a stain on it, right? Like sometimes the light shows us too much. Happiness is found in the Shadowlands. And this is, this is all of this. Think about it now. Nothing in this chapter is saying, do this to make a list of your shortcomings. Do this to take a list, make a list of your moral inventory. We're talking about all these ways that we find light and love in our lives. Shadow boxing your moral inventory would be, you make a list of ways you failed. And now you box around them. You think about them. You exist in the shadows. You look at them just enough to see what you need to see. You don't turn the lights on and see a monster looking back at you in the mirror, right? None of us want to be evil. We don't wake up and say, who can I fuck over today? There might be people that do that. I could actually list a few, but for the most part, we don't do that. The shadow self is not the evil self. It is just a part of us we don't want to see. And in AA, the part of us we don't want to see is what we call denial. Alcoholic who hasn't admitted they're an alcoholic is not seeing a shadow self. They're denying that they have a problem with drinking. Denial. A sober person for six months who does nothing to address why they got drunk in the first place is not shadow boxing any of the reasons that led them to pick up a drink. They're in denial. They're not looking at the shadow lands. Our shadow self is not our evil self. It is just that part of us that we do not want to see. Our unacceptable self by reason of nature, nurture, and choice. See, by reason of nature, our personality traits, nurture, how we were raised, and because of those things, our choices. That bit of chosen blindness, or what AA calls denial, is what allows us to do evil and cruel things without recognizing them as evil or cruel. So ongoing shadow boxing is absolutely necessary because we all have a well-denied shadow self. We all have that which we cannot see, will not see, dare not see. It would destroy our public and personal self-image. That's really profound. That's really, really profound. That makes me rethink not my list of failures and transgressions and shortcomings, but it makes me rethink how I feel about them so I can take a better look at them. This part of chapter four takes me right back to chapter one, step one, when you're finally admitting that you're powerless over alcohol and that your life is unmanageable. Your whole moral inventory, each one of those things could be a step one again, where you're admitting, I did this thing and here's why. And here's how alcohol played a role or not. Here's how my childhood played a role or not. You're doing with each of these things exactly what you did to get to the place where you create these things. Boy, this is a rambly podcast. We live in denial. We deny the things we don't like about ourselves. My whole childhood was denial. I just denied that I was being abused because it was too hard to think about. So I just put it away. I stuffed it down and denied that it was happening. I think a lot of kids do that when they're being abused. They just can't think about it. It's too much. It's too much to believe. It's too much to radically accept that someone that tells you they love you could do what they do to you. It's, it's an impossibility. I can tell you that it still is an impossibility. The book gets in, in now to how we look at these things and immediately come up with excuses, which is self-protection, right? And deflect blame. It talked about, we don't want to notice our shadow self because the, our public image will get you know, tarnished. One of the first things I did in therapy with Judy, you know, before I married Eric, so I was in my late 20s, early 30s, was I said, I have, there's two me's. There's the Barb everyone sees, the gregarious, happy Barb, and then there's the real Barb, this skinny, forlorn, forlorn sort of helpless little girl with her head on her knees, feeling very sad. My friend Polly and I call our inner self Phoebe. But here's what holding on to a persona does. Holding on to a persona feeds the shadow self. It feeds it, allows the ego to whisper all those thoughts into your head, right? Conflict, difficulties, failures, and enemies, etc., are necessary mirrors. They're necessary mirrors for us to acknowledge these realities in ourselves. 
It's when you lie in bed after you lost the race and you run it over and over and over again in your head. That's the mirror. Part of running the race over and over again is to look at external factors. Okay, I didn't run my best time, but there was a headwind. Okay, I didn't win, but I slipped in the mud and fell. You know, like sometimes there's a lot, it doesn't make the losing any better, but you come to see all the varieties of reasons why these things happened. There's a biblical example where Jesus says to somebody, why are you trying to help that person get a splinter out of their eye when you have a giant log in your eye? And I looked at that like, what, what does that even mean here? What, like what? But what he was doing, he wasn't using a moralistic example. Why are you counseling someone on alcohol when you drink all the time anyway? That would be a very same thing. Why are you telling someone not to have a second drink when you've had five, right? Why are you telling someone to get the splinter out of their eye and helping them when you haven't even touched the log in your own eye? How about you take the log out of your eye? and then have a better glimpse of the splinter in that person's eye. Genius. I liked it because it took away judgment. It exemplifies the title of the chapter, which is lamp. When the log is out of your eye, you'll have a much better ability to see what's around you. So step four is the addressing of our log before pointing out someone else's splinter. This helps us stop the blaming, accusing, denying, thus displacing the problem. And this is me. This is me all the time all the time. And I've actually caught myself a couple of times. I got frustrated with Kenny the other night over something I didn't get finished and the reasons why. When I was lying in bed, I texted him and said, look, I got really overwhelmed today, but what I, I want you to know that the two hours you swam in the pool with Jack tonight, so I could finish project A and clean up the kitchen and this and that. I appreciate that because none of us wanted to go in the pool. <laughs> Poor Jack just wanted to swim and Kenny's like, I'll do it. And they had a blast. I mean, Kenny's wonderful that way. Part of me, the alcoholic me, would have just stayed angry and refused to acknowledge that that was a kind thing that I saw. The analogy of the eye used by Jesus in the Bible here focuses on how seeing clearly can prevent evil, that evil thrives in the unconscious and the unaware, and the way that evil can... Now, evil makes me think, oh, how does the devil get you? That's not what I'm talking about. Poor choice making, poor decision making, ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time, all of a sudden realizing you're in the middle of the pond and the ice is too thin and you're going to follow through. This is like a thousand tiny steps right here. That when we're not paying attention, when we're not focused, when we're unconscious to our strong lamp, to our inner self, bad things can happen. And that's when they do, because we've opened the door to it by not paying attention. So seeing clearly can prevent evil. Evil thrives in the unconscious and the unaware. The lamp of the body is the eye. Sometimes people will say the eyes are the window to the soul or to the heart. And I think that's true. I think people have a light in their eye. Whenever somebody is really focusing on something or they're asleep with their eyes open or they're shit face drunk or something, I always call that shark eyes. If you ever look at the eyes of a shark, they're black. They're just creepy. That analogy plays a big role in step four. By looking at all of the ways we feel we fucked up in all of the ways that we are not what we wish we were, we cleanse ourselves. We light a light inside that allows us to see, oh yeah, that really bad thing did happen. And I can never unbat it, but these things all played a role. Step four creates a trustworthy lamp that accurately shows your light. I thought it was just a list of how I fucked up. Look at all it does. Two things, and then I'll go into my journal entries. I've talked a lot about praying and how we pray for patience. And we don't get patience. We get ways to be patient, right? I talked about running into things on social media that speak to me in regard to step four to what I'm learning and all. And I talk about how I look at my list of mistakes and flaws and I pray about them and I feel like I'm not getting any help. Like nothing changes. I pray for organization and I'm as disorganized as ever. I pray to not be angry and I just get more angry, right? <laughs> because what I'm getting is more chances to not be angry and choosing to be angry instead. Facebook came along and there's a meme, which I'm going to read. And it's in a movie and it's Morgan Freeman talking to the actor that plays the mom in Gilmore Girls. That's all I know. And here's what he says. If someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If they prayed for courage, does God give them courage or does he give them opportunities to be courageous? If someone prayed for their family to be closer, you think God zaps them with warm, fuzzy feelings or does he give them opportunities to love each other? That right there is step four for me. When I look at my long list of things that I want to fix and all the things in my life that are going wrong and I pray about it, I pray for them to get fixed. And what I'm being given is the chances to fix them. That was a key piece for me. 
The last paragraph of this of the of chapter four, step four is also good. God does not directly destroy evil the way our heroic and dualistic minds would like to imagine. God is much wiser, wastes nothing, and includes everything. The God of the Bible is best known for transmuting and transforming our very evils into our own more perfect good, prodigal son. God uses our sins in our own favor. God brings us through failure from unconsciousness to ever deeper consciousness and conscience. How could that not be good news for just about everybody? So essentially what it's saying is he doesn't just punish. You know, a lot of religions will just tell you that God is punitive and you're going to burn in hell or go to purgatory. That's all man-made to control people, my belief. What he does is prodigal son us. Pennsylvania, right near where Kenny lives, there's a high population of Amish people. And in the Amish religion, teenagers are allowed to leave. The, The communities are called the Ordnungs and they're allowed to leave and go live your life. Do what you need to do. And then you either make a decision to stay living the modern life of the English, or you make the decision to come back and and live according to the religion, and you will be welcomed back. It's like the ultimate prodigal son, right? There are those who think the teenage years are how do you you weed out, (laughs) separate the wheat from the chaff, let the cream rise to the top. Anyone that survives their teenage years is worthy to go on and be an adult. (laughs) I think there's truth in both of those analogies. But all of this process, when you look at step four, and it just simply says, take a fearless moral inventory of yourself, a searching and fearless moral inventory. It immediately makes you think like you're just self-judging. And it's not that at all. It's having you look at everything. I know I've said that 50 million times, but it's been eye-opening for me. So I'll read the questions and summarize my answers because some of them were hard. And I'll admit, I haven't sat down with a piece of paper and a pencil and really made the list. And that's something that I need to do. Truth will set you free, but it tends to make you miserable. So we, we talk about that. So it asks, what are you afraid will happen if you're honest with yourself? Can you begin to imagine being free of that fear? So honest with myself, my biggest fear with being honest to others is that they won't like me. Like, you know, I wrote my book about losing Molly and there's so many details in there that I'm ashamed of. And so I think I often say to people, I hope you still like me when you finish the book. Like, Barbara, (laughs) first of all, I shouldn't care. If they don't like me, that's none of my business. That's on them. But that's my first worry, that when they see that I have these flaws and imperfections, I was at a road race today and I was hugging another angel mom and and she said, you're such an inspiration to me. And I said, oh my God, I'm a hot mess most of the time. And she looked at me and she said, well, we all are. It doesn't mean you can't be an inspiration. But that's my first thought is to to say how flawed I am. So being honest with others is I'm afraid they won't love me anymore, this self-love thing. Honest with myself. I feel like this whole podcast experience has been my journey on being honest with myself. I'm very honest with myself. I don't know that I do anything with it. And I think therein lies the rub for me. But what am I, what am I afraid about if I'm super honest with myself? That I'll hate myself so much I can't unhate myself. I, I, maybe that's it. And, and I don't think self-hatred is really an issue for me anymore. I, I hate that the choices I made caused the reactions they did. So I have a lot of regret, which again, I have to get through because I can't, I can't fix it. I can just be better moving forward. But what my biggest fear about honesty is that I'll, that I'll see how much of a role I really did play in all of it, whatever all of it is. Goes into my blaming other people for not getting my stuff done, right? I just want to deflect, deflect, deflect. The deflection zone is a safe place. So my fear, if I'm honest with myself, is that I won't be able to forgive myself maybe. And it would be wonderful to be free of that fear. Okay, so this talks about the confidence of something greater than us, loving us, that radical acceptance of love, that then, and only then can we look at our failures. When have you used a weakness or a failure as an excuse not to move forward? (laughs) I think they're talking to me. How might clinging to a surface fault keep you from looking more deeply at the ways in which you need to change? Okay, this I need to print and put on on my forehead backwards and stand in the mirror all day. (laughs) And here's how I responded. All, period, the, period, time, period. This epitomizes where I'm at. Oh, well, I wasn't a good runner because I have asthma. So I could never, I could never stay healthy long enough to be a good runner. Okay, well, okay. Except I could have eaten well. I could have not drank alcohol. Could have gone to bed early. I could have gone to the weight room. I could have transferred to a different school and gotten a different coach that would have trained me harder. I could have done a million things. I could have been a way better runner than I was. But a part of me was happy with as good as I was. And a part of me didn't want to give up all of my self-destructive behaviors that also fed some need inside of me. So then I wrote here, anything I fail becomes my reason for saying, fuck it, I quit. And that, and that's, that's true. I'm never going to be good. So, 
you know, if I'm not going to, going to be a really good runner, I'll just go out and get drunk tonight. Cause who cares all the time? I did this when Jack has to do something he doesn't want to do. He will often say, Oh, fine, <laughs> fine. And he sounds defeated, but he slumps along and does it. He's so sweet. I'll say the same thing, but I say it with anger. Fine, fine. You know what? Fine, fine. I do that a hundred times a day. I oftentimes deflect my shortcomings onto Kenny and I have to be careful about that. I have to stop doing it because when I do it, it gives other people permission to do it. I use Kenny having drinks to fall into not wanting, to not working out and poor eating. I fall into my all or nothing mode. I will say, I don't like always being the one that has to control whether or not we drink like the deciding factor. So I just need to step out of it. Anyway, so that's the alcohol piece of that. All right, the next question. The goal is actually not to be the perfect avoidance of all sin, which is not possible, but the struggle itself. People only come to deeper consciousness by intentional struggles with contradictions, conflicts, inconsistencies, inner confusions, and what the biblical tradition calls sin or moral failure. I hate that word sin. How does it feel to understand that avoidance of sin, of all sin, isn't possible? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> what would it be like to focus less on sin and avoiding it and more on finding wisdom in the struggle? Oh my God, this is, this is me all the time. This is me all the time. Do I apply it to myself? No, but whenever I'm giving anyone advice or, or support or anything, I always say, well, let's look at the struggle. What are you learning from what's happening to you? There's a lesson here. What are you learning from it? Yes, you dated this guy for a year and you broke up and it's not a wasted year. It's not because in, the, in those months, you learned things about people, about yourself. Nothing is a waste and nothing is just a sin. It's a struggle. So I wrote, talk about the journey because I'm a journey person. Well, it should feel like a relief. <laughs> It mostly illustrates my willingness to use blame in my life. And this was true, although it does feel like a relief. Having said that, I am all about finding wisdom in the struggle. So alcohol avoidance is just a dry drunk. Looking into the events preceding the drinking is where the living in recovery comes. Find the wisdom in the struggle. Find the wisdom in the struggle. Doing the steps, finding the wisdom in the struggle. Shadow boxing your fearless moral inventory, a searching and fearless moral inventory. You're doing this for the sake of truth, humility, and generosity of spirit, not vengeance on the self or some kind of total victory over the self. Seeing and naming our actual faults is probably not so much a gift to us as it is to those around us. People want us to be lovable. They want us to be easy to be around, right? It doesn't mean we have to be something we're not, but the more comfortable we are with who we are, the easier we are to be around with other people. Other people can probably see our faults better than we can. <laughs> right about a time when someone criticized your behavior, Take a step back from your defensive reaction and look for the truth that may lie at the heart of that criticism. How can you help begin an honest moral inventory? How can this help you? So I've said this before, my defenses fly up when I feel like I'm wrongly criticized of something. Of course, we all feel wrongly criticized at first. So I have to, I have to really look at, okay, what did I do that might allow someone to criticize me or accuse me of something I didn't do, right? That's where that stepping out comes in. I'm actually good at diving into criticism, stepping out of myself and looking at myself from the outside. But the example that comes up was when my friend Jack, Jack Frazier told me how selfish I was because I wouldn't make time for him. And he was right. I was using all of the feedback I got from my runners, doing all these great things so the runners would love me and the families would love me, right? I was just so pleased with it. I also liked that they were happy. I mean, it wasn't just all about me, but I did, I used that as a reason to not do other things. Years and years later, looking at where that came from, looking at Jack's side in my double bind nature, damned if you do, damned if you don't. I'm good at putting people in a double bind. What we hate in others is typically what we hate in ourselves. That's a tough one. Now it says our shadow self is not our evil self. That's what this next set of questions is around. It's just that part of us we don't wanna see or acknowledge, our denial. Right about a time when your unwillingness to acknowledge an inner failure or weakness led you to hurt someone else. All right, so years ago, I taught at Camp Greenacre. I was a children's class teacher with Aaron and Tahira. And it was maybe four weeks, five weeks into the summer, and we'd gotten into a routine and everything. And we had a small group of kids. It was an evening class. And they were just antsy. And there's, there was, I've, I've actually given this example in a, in a podcast before. It was this Baha'i faith song. La, da, 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 la, la, wa, pa. 
啦啦啦啦啦，阿拉瓦帕，阿拉瓦帕，阿拉瓦帕。So a lot of pa is a one-word prayer means God is glorious. So I put little funny things in like Susie is a snorky, a la wa pa. Danny is a doofus, a la wa pa. We were more giggling and laughing with each other. But what happened was these kids then went home, went to their rooms with their parents, and continued this, calling each other the names and then saying a la wa pa. And the parents were they were very very probably a bit rigid Baha'is, and so rather than have a, they scolded their kids, and they said, but this is what we did in children's classes tonight, and so. The leaders of the school that at that time were very, very rigid, and they were livid, furious that this would happen. We all sat there, just sort of, and I'm the one that started singing. I'm the one that started it. I did the first verse. We all joined in, and they said, Who, "Whose idea was this?" And I just sat there. I was petrified. And Aaron said, "It was me. We were just trying to have fun. We weren't trying to be disrespectful. And I'm sorry." And she got like yelled at. And afterwards, I just I said, "Oh my God, I can't, I can't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did that to you." And she was very kind about it, but I felt terrible. I felt terrible. It took me like three weeks to finally go to the director of the school and say, "I need to come clean with you. That wasn't Aaron that started that little song. That was me." That came to mind right away when I was doing this this question. You know, it took me all that time to just say, "What the heck? That was me." I'm trying to be better about this, and it's not—it's not that I don't want to get in trouble. I think it's the whole acknowledging that I made this poor choice, and I have to own it. The other thing that comes to mind over the years is that you know I grew up with you know two fathers: the one that raised me and the one that fathered me, and my mother. And that conflict in relationship all the time. Don't tell, don't tell, don't tell. Right? And I saw what I saw was we had a life, and then we had a, an escape life. We could leave for a few days and escape and be someplace else. And I remember Roy would get very frustrated with me when he decided he wanted me to be his girlfriend. He this one this would come and go. He would then say, "I'm just your escape. I don't want to be your stupid escape." And then when when likely I now realize when he had someone else that he wasn't telling me about, and it was okay for me to be the escape. He was much more supportive of it. I love being your little escape. Very very back and forth for you know twelve years time obviously, but I always in all my relationships had an escape. When I dated Jay, actually, I went off to college before I ever had an escape with Jay. But I realized I was at college and I wanted to date other people. So I, you know, so I guess with Jay it would have been Mark. That was sort of what drew me to break up with Jay. And then with David, more than once I had somebody else. And it wasn't that I didn't love David. It was this escape hatch, and and it was horrible. And David knew about these things, and it broke his heart. He forgave me again and again. When I was with Chaz, that was <laughs> I had my same time next year relationship with a fellow track coach. We didn't live in the same places. We only saw each other once or twice a year. We always connected. Am I proud of that now? No, but I had long-term relationships at home. Chaz, Graham, and I had these these people that I would connect with. Eric, <laughs> that would have been my teacher friend that I, you know, connected with Rothenberg, and then Kenny, of course, it was Roy. So I'm relationshipless right now. I've been with nobody, nobody for a long time. <laughs> That's how that will be because I can't. I have a lot of work to do, right? So where does that leave me and Kenny? Kenny and I are like a lot of parents with dead children and massive trauma. We get along really well together, and we run a home well together. And so we have an understanding that we do these things well. We decided to have Jack together. I have my own room. He has his own room. We we are partners in crime, and we have incredible love and commitment to one another. And I think that's what most marriages are, twenty-five years in. Anyway, they become contracts, so to speak, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So my denial is my unresolved trauma and how it's continued to. Now I look back on it. I'm at the point now where I realize it and acknowledge it. Wow, heavy, heavy podcast. We need conflicts, relationship difficulties, moral failures, defeats, even seeming enemies, or we will not ever have a way to spot or track our shadow self. Because that's how we see ourselves. Those things are re- reflections, mirrors. So I wrote, I see it. So the question was, when have you caught your shadow self at work in your life? How did you respond? I see it now, and how I blame Kenny for the things that he is not responsible for. Outwardly, it looks like I want to improve in some way, and then fall victim to my failures. I fail because I feel unworthy and not deserving of success. So I find ways to blame my lack of success on him and our chaotic life. Sorry, Kenny. Once we see clearly, once we take the log out of our eye, the game is over, because evil succeeds only by disguising itself as good or necessary or helpful. Boy, to Robin and Steph and Roy and 
even Gene Connolly and Chris Rath. I, I have a list of people that come to mind, Doug, when I read this <laughs> and I pick them, right? But that's my piece in it. Amy, no one consciously does evil. The very fact that anyone can do stupid, cruel, or destructive things shows that they are at that moment unconscious and unaware. Think about that. Evil proceeds from a lack of consciousness. What do you think of the idea that evil acts arise from unconscious or unaware actions? Does this make it easier or harder to admit failure? How would your life change if you became more conscious? So a huge thing comes to mind was when I was a little girl, my mother went off skiing with my biological dad for a week in Colorado, and she left us all home with my dad. I got really sick, vomiting, deliriously, horribly sick. I think I slept for three days. I was so sick. And then I got a little better. And then when I got better, I got afraid because I was home alone with my abuser. And I do not believe I was, I might've, that might've been one of the times I was abused, but right now I feel like it wasn't. But I look at how actions like that affect me and affect how I turned out, right? I look at everything I intuited from that treatment in my childhood. And how does that, how is that a part of how I treat people? My mother went away for a week. And I felt horrible about it. And I swore I would never leave my kids. And I sat on a couch in the room right below the one I'm in while Gracie was sobbing. It's my birthday. Please don't go. I don't want you to go. And I left her and Kenny and Molly. And I went to Amsterdam with Roy. And yes, I did get molested that week. And I, cause I remember thinking that was somehow I was the punishment, right? And what happened to me? Molly died. And that's been a hard connection to undo, a really hard connection to undo. I swore I'd never leave my kids and I got talked into doing it. So what does that make me? <laughs> it also makes me able a little bit more to forgive my mother because I think she made those decisions on the same compulsions that I did, all this familial trauma that we have, generational trauma. That's what came to mind just now. It's not what I wrote in the book. It's what came to mind now as I'm talking to you, that when I read that evil happens in the unconscious, I wasn't trying to be neglectful to my children. I didn't know Molly was going to die of a brain tumor. I didn't leave because anyway, I got convinced to do it. I did it. It still blows my mind. So I wrote, I can see this clearly because I create chaos to busy my mind, survival mechanism, and it allows the bad choices to continue. Evil is in my chaos. Doug is a logic logical example of this in the year preceding Molly's death. In the two years following, he created chaos. He facilitated my chaos. He acknowledged that chaos was part of our dark nature and that it was something to be explored. Roy, in his divorce, when I agreed to help him, I just spent hours, hours away from my family, searching through journal entries of mine and conversations and everything to help him get his kids back. You know, I, I buried myself in it. And then I fell in love with him and, and just made terrible choices, all wrapped up in this chaos that wasn't even my chaos. They weren't my kids. It wasn't my divorce. And then most recently, Steph in the charter school, you know, I, I, I thought maybe I'm ready for some part-time work. I'll teach phys ed part-time. And then I get, they call me and ask me to come and be the executive director. And I just jump and say, yes, I'd be honored. And then I'm working 80 hours a week in a really unhealthy, chaotic, terrible environment this beautiful, potentially beautiful school that fell apart. Evil acts arising from lack of consciousness. I get it. I get it. And the last one, the God of the Bible is best known for transmuting and transforming our very evils into our very own more perfect good. He uses our sins in our favor. Okay. Talked about that already. Somehow goodness is transferred by radiance, reflection, and resonance with another goodness. That makes sense. If you fight fire with fire, can't why can't you... Why can't you put it out music with music, right? Song with song. More than by any other act of self-achievement, reflection and residence with another goodness. We do not pull ourselves up. We are pulled up. Write about an experience when you knew absolutely that you were not saved by your own action or strength. How might this make you less afraid of admitting weaknesses? So of course, what's going to come back to me now both is, is my job loss, my humiliating job loss, and then Molly's death. And in both of those times, the people in my life that just accepted I was going through a thing and liked me anyway, are the ones that pulled me up. They saw the good in me and they returned the good in me. They felt bad for what happened to me. A gesture that would come to mind would be the indoor track committee. 
I lost my job in like January and it was in the middle of the indoor track season. And I said to Larry, I still have my teaching certificate. I'm, I didn't do anything wrong. I got caught up in a political thing and I needed to bring him a letter that, that acknowledged why I was fired. And he looked, read it and he agreed. And he said, then let's just put it, put it behind us. Cause you're no different to me. And that was just a small gesture. I got to keep officiating track meets. It was a piece of me. I didn't have to also say goodbye to it, it was profound. Two small gestures that come to mind now are my friend, Suzanne, when I was a little girl. And when I shared to her that I couldn't go home because I was being molested, that I had been molested. And she was not an affectionate person at all. And she climbed out of bed and into my bed and hugged me. I think I've talked about this before too. And then my big aunt Connie. So when, my, when the phone call came, I, I left my mother a note when I told her I was being abused in her scarf drawer. And I was afraid that she either hadn't seen it or that she wouldn't believe it. So when the phone call came and that I needed to call her back, that she had found my note, I was terrified. I didn't know at the time that she had shared with my grandmother and my aunt what the note said. And so I was wandering around just all befuddled. And I didn't know what to do, what to do, what to do. And she said, come here. And she pulled me into her lap. Again, she's not an affectionate person that way. And she sat me in her lap and she said, this is not your fault. This abuse has nothing to do with you. You are a good person. It has to do with the horrible choices the adults in your life have made. She was wonderful. And I actually stayed with her. I stayed with her and with Suzanne when I came back from vacation until my mother could get my father out of the house. I just wouldn't, I mean, I'm obviously not going to go home. When it comes to Molly's death, I mean, I had, I had a community of people around me all the time. I came home to a yard full of flowers. Paul Barassa came and mowed my lawn. People came and cleaned our house. You know, the Molly's memorial service, 1,300 people coming and filling that theater. You know, all of those things pulled me up. Probably one of the most significant things was my friend Deb coming over one day and just sitting under a tree with me. I just couldn't move. I couldn't function. I was a mess. And she's like, just give me your feet. And she, I gave her my feet and she put my legs in her lap and she just rubbed them and put a blanket on them. And we just sat under the tree and talked about this or that. I cried for a while and she just held my legs, right? It seems like nothing, but that's a nice metaphor for helping somebody. Coach Ludi is another one. All my trials and tribulations, he never once wavered in his love and admiration for me ever or in his respect for me as a human being. Ever, ever, ever. I was always his Higgy, always. It was pretty amazing. And sadly, knowing now that it was all for ill intent and she didn't, wasn't doing it because she loved me, Robin was a huge piece of why I was okay, especially in the summer, you know, in the, in the weeks and months directly following Molly's death. She, she was at my house every day. She never, she never missed a day. She was solid in helping me and making sure I was okay. What I know about those days now from her end, sour it a little bit, but I didn't know at the time. And so, so it helped me. So there it is. That's a lot of information. What might our homework be? <laughs> Breathing lessons. So one of the things to do is to read a Psalm that's from the Bible. So those of you that aren't religious you could read it just for historical sake or see what it says, see what the meaning might be. Take it out of biblical context. Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Well, that could be just self-knowledge too. The universe knows our ways, right? The wind whispering in our head. So we're supposed to read that slowly. It's actually really, it's not super religious at all. It's about just something bigger than ourselves knowing us. Our homework this week is to shadow box as a physical activity, shadow box in the mirror while you think about your moral inventory, maybe hang your moral, make a list and hang it on the wall and shadow box it. Make believe you're punching it, right? Toss it around, go on a bike ride and with every pedal, you know, go back and forth on an issue, right? Let your body lead you to the inner space where your shadow lives. Oh, that's interesting. And then notice the feelings that rise as you move back and forth with this hidden side of yourself. And then there's a quote that says, only the soul knows that we grow best in the shadowlands. And that's where if it's too bright, we're burned. And if it's too dark, we wilt. But in the shadowlands, we have just enough of both to grow. This one says, sit in a darkened room for a period of time, perhaps 10 or 15 minutes. Let your thoughts dwell on the darkness, on how you feel in the dark. Then light a candle and focus on the candlelight. Notice how it fills the space around itself and expands into the darkened room. After a time, Turn on a light in the room. And again, notice the effect of the candle's light. How does that candle represent the presence of the light of the world? Huh. 
light of the world. That sounds a little hokey, doesn't it? But I think what that means is just sort of universal light, universal love, universal energy. This will be a, a hard week of work for me. And I, I hope that you'll reach out and share any of, you that, any of you that are actually doing this, what that said for you. Okay, remember, the 12 steps are for the internal work. The 12 traditions are for the integrity of the program in which you're doing the work. So my little podcast series here has the integrity of AA, and, and I'm not the big fixer or anything, but I'm not doing it within that framework, so it's a little different. But I like including the traditions. Step four, each group should be autonomous, except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Like, you know, the Monday night group is the Monday night group. It's autonomous. It, it has its own leadership, its own set of volunteers. It's autonomous. Except when you go to the, like the, they have these AA convention type things, or, or if you have a speaker, like when the only time it loses autonomy is when it's being affiliated with AA, like with another meeting, which makes sense. Meetings can be quite personal and it's somebody's safe space. So a searching and fearless moral inventory. This will be an interesting week. I really appreciate your listening and being patient with a lot of my divulging of secrets and things that I thought I would keep secret forever. I think it's just time for me to talk about things that come up you know, no matter how painful they are. So I hope that this series isn't boring you all to death. <laughs> my goal and my hope is that you'll all find ways to apply it to your life, even if alcohol isn't an issue. Be good to yourself. Don't beat yourself up over your list of flaws. We all have them. Be good to someone else. Throw a compliment someone's way. And as always, have a good day, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening and supporting the podcast. Feel free to leave a review and share my stories with your friends please reach out with your own stories as I love connecting with my listeners. If you would like to get to know Molly, head over to mollybfoundation.org to see what she is all about. If you want to see what I'm up to next, you can find me on Instagram at barb underscore 444, on Facebook as Barb Higgins, and at my website, a thousandtinysteps.com. And while you're there, sign up for my newsletter, a weekly way to find out what's up in the life of Barb Higgins.